I'm Alyssa Ford Morrell. I'm an Extension Master Gardener with the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. I'm in my garden and right now in early September, I've got three native vines that are really doing beautifully and I wanted to share them with you. So this vine is the first of them that I wanna show you. This is Lanicera sempervirens or more commonly known as trumpet honeysuckle or coral honeysuckle. This is a vine that is common pretty much all over the East Coast, um, and it is semi-evergreen uh, up into zone eight or so. Mine, which is new in this spot this year, but I've had for a number of years, has kept most, not all of its leaves, through the winter. Uh, this vine is a host plant to two different Lepidoptera, the spring azure and the snowberry clear wing moth. And that means that those Lepidoptera can lay their babies on this vine and the babies can get nourishment from the vine, which they cannot do from just any plant. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful uh, flower that is really popular with hummingbirds. They love any kind of a tubular flower like this one is, and they will come in and I've sat here and watched them and they check out each little tube. They go in fairly slowly if you don't disturb them and they'll just go through each one of these and then they'll fly over to another cluster and drink from that. Our native honeysuckle is a very beautiful red and yellow flower and it attracts all sorts of animals and birds and insects, unlike the invasive Japanese honeysuckle, which I will admit is pretty and has a nice scent, but it is invasive and it gets into the wild and it outcompetes the native plants and does not provide good healthy nutrition for the insects and birds that need it. Once the flowers are pollinated, they will develop these little berries that turn red as the season progresses and are available to be eaten by birds and provide great nutrition. Another interesting thing about this plant is these double clasped leaves which are in front of each bundle of flowers. The Lanicera sempervirens is a large vine, can grow up to 20 feet. So it's really best if you can put it on a dedicated fence or trellis. Otherwise, it is likely to sprawl all over the ground. We hired a very talented friend to design our trellis so that it can actually tip forward. It detaches at the top and it can rotate forward so that if we need to paint the house, we don't have to damage the vine in order to do so. You might want to think about that sort of consideration depending on where you put your vine. We are now standing in front of the Clematis virginiana urgens bower. This is a native clematis that is common pretty much all over the East Coast. It is a pollinator powerhouse. If you can see, there are pollinators all over these flowers and they are so busy getting that pollen that I'm really not nervous standing here. I'm certainly not going to disturb uh, this wasp-like one over here. Uh, because I don't want him to take his attention off of that. But they're very, very happy to be getting all the pollen and nectar that this plant produces every year. Uh, the plant is a host plant for one Lepidoptera, the Clematis clear wing moth, which means that the caterpillars can feed on this plant and not on very much else. The plant is um, a essentially deciduous plant that will drop all its leaves and only the most mature stems that have become woody will stick around through the winter. You can cut this way back uh, through the winter if you want. 
Virgin's Bower is a wonderful plant if you care about supporting America's pollinators, which are really struggling a great deal right now. And it's an easy plant to grow. As you can see, I'm just using a cup hook there to hold these vines as they grow beneath my bay window. I'd like to call your attention to the edges of the clematis leaves here, which are in groups of three, and the edges of the leaves are very toothed, very jagged. This is a difference from the invasive sweet autumn clematis, which is a real problem in our area. This is how you can tell the difference between the two. This vine is the passion flower vine, Maypop, Passiflora incarnata is the Latin name. Uh, it is one of a couple of passion flowers that are native to the eastern seaboard and the mid-Atlantic region. It is common in the southeast and the mid-Atlantic area. I don't think it goes particularly far north. This plant dies down in the winter. You can really cut it almost all the way to the ground and it will pop back from the roots every year uh, quite ferociously. This plant sometimes is a bit of a bug because it likes to spread and if you don't keep control of it, it will spread all over the place. This is one of the vines that's a really good idea to have it on a trellis. Otherwise, it's going to try to take over your garden. It's a bit of a bug in that way, but a beautiful one. It's one of my favorite flowers since childhood. My mother actually had a passion flower planted on the little fence that uh, separated my swing set when I was a child from the rest of the garden, and I've loved it ever since. The passion flower is a wonderful flower for bumblebees and carpenter bees who do most of the pollinating of the passion flower. Uh, also, hummingbirds will visit it, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the passion flower is really built. I always think of a car wash when I see a bumblebee going underneath the anthers of the, uh, of the flower because it looks like a car getting scrubbed by that little arm that comes down to do that. Here's a carpenter bee who is on a passion flower and she's working oh so hard to collect the pollen and nectar that the flower is providing. She wants to gather all that food up both for herself and for any larva that she is helping to raise. You can see her back is covered with the golden pollen dust and when she flies on to another passion flower that dust is going to rub off on the other flower and pollinate it. She's drinking from the nectaries right now, which is the reward that the flower provides to insects for the service of doing the pollination. The flower lures the insect in that way. The passion flower sets these wonderful fruit, which are absolutely edible by people. We make jams and jellies and juices out of them. The reason that I say that the passion flower can be a bit of a thug is because this stem here is the first stem that I planted, the only stem that I planted this spring. But you can see that other little sprigs have come up all around it, about 15 or so I'd say in a three foot radius. It really likes to spread. It also comes up rather late in the season. That's one of two explanations for the name may pop, that it may pop out of the ground in May. The other explanation has to do with the fruit, which ripens to a yellow color and kind of dries and hollows up. And if it drops to the ground and you step on it, it may pop. Here are the adorable tendrils that help the plant climb. Thank you for spending some time in my garden with me today. I hope this has given you some ideas of some of the beautiful native vines that might work in your garden. Happy gardening.